Hi, Misha here, and I did three videos looking at different Starfleet Federation ships. Each of them had a dozen ships looking one at uh, freighters, transports, another at science, survey, research ships, and a third video on uh, a dozen warships, even though the Federation is totally, still Starfleet is totally not a military. And I've also done one on Klingon Battle Cruiser Evolution. And I figured I have to re-talk about the Romulans, even though I don't really have much new to show you, because the Gomas collection is at its end. But, uh, yeah, let's just talk about the evolution of the Romulan Warbird. The Romulan kind of larger scale battleship. And unfortunately, the Romulans have been pretty underrepresented in Star Trek. Although that is sometimes to their advantage, maintaining a bit of mystery. But they are a old and permanent power. Dating back to the schism with Vulcan, which I believe was around the 5th century human time. A little, about 2,000 years ago by the time of Star Trek. So we know that they had interstellar travel a long time ago. And the only way they could have ever possibly made it from... Vulcan to Romulus and Remus would have been with some type of warp drive. I guess it is possible they could have had sleeper ships or generational ships, but that doesn't seem the vein of Star Trek. We don't really see many of those used frequently. I think uh, cons would be the most famous, but it seems like it took them a while to establish their society. And uh, so their technology is roughly on par with humans in the 22nd century when humans first start to really explore far outside of their uh, solar system, our solar system, Sol. And that, of course, led or will lead or leads to the Romulan Earth War, which took place in the mid to late 2150s and ended around 2160, 2161, depending on the canon. And so, starting with Enterprise, the first Romulan vessel we see is this here. It never has an on screen name or designation. It's often just called the 22nd century Romulan bird of prey. But the Romulans themselves tend to refer to their ships not as birds of prey, but rather war birds, which is, you know, syntax really. Reserving bird of prey more or less for the Klingons. And this ship is very much an homage to the next ship here from the original series, but in general, it is pretty well comparable in size. It's only about 130 meters long, but keeping in mind that it's wider than it is long, it still has respectable mass and volume. And this was an era in the time where Klingon ships were under 200 meters. And even Earth ships were under 250 meters. So while maybe a little smaller, it was pretty pretty much in line with everything else. It would have had warp drive, but we really don't know much about it because we, we don't know the crew. We know that it had disruptor cannons. And unfortunately, in the episode we see it in, which is otherwise a very good episode, Minefield, it decloaks. And this is a problem for a lot of us Star Trek fans. 
it was an unnecessary element that frankly ruined an otherwise cool ship in a good episode. There have been a lot of kind of head cannon and beta cannon explanations, for example, that it was a failed experiment for Cloak. The truth of the matter is, they fucked up. And they do tacitly acknowledge this by Season 4 of Enterprise when further Romulan ships we encounter do not have Cloak. So it's just one of those things we kind of have to ignore. But that said, out of the way, it fits very nice into the chronology and it doesn't make future ships, at least by the timeline, look weird. But it doesn't look clunky or old-fashioned. It has a very raptor, bird's claw thing going on with its nacelles. Of course, impulse drives in the back. And it has some kind of torpedo bay in the front, torpedo launcher. It could also be a deflector, but yeah. And they wanted to actually paint the bird on the bottom for the episode, but again, some of the producers ixnayed this. But it was said that they would have started painting birds on them for the Earth-Romulan War if they'd gotten around to showing that. But I really like it, in general. It's just the unfortunate cloaking thing. But this would have been their primary warship in the mid-22nd century, and probably one of the main ships that would have been in the Earth-Romulan War and used afterwards. And it would directly lead, in the Star Trek timeline, to this next ship, the Romulan... Bird of Prey from TOS, although again, I would kind of call it a war bird just to distinguish and give Bird of Prey to the Klingons. And yes, I know that originally for Star Trek 3, that Bird of Prey, which is called out specifically, was meant to be a stolen Romulan ship, but that was never made canon, and there's enough evidence to the contrary that the Klingons had Birds of Prey, partially because of Enterprise, earlier on but anyway so warbird or bird of prey this is very much a successor vessel it's the same length maybe just a hair longer at 131 132 meters it has uh, a number of decks not a huge number but somewhere between four and six depending on who you ask in universe this would have had the first Romulan cloak but while this was a new and very powerful device it wasn't perfect while it was visually shielding the ship from detection and it kind of blurred its sensor image they still had a sensor ghost or some other traces on the sensor so it was not a perfect cloak by any stretch of the imagination but it did obscure the ship's exact position and possibly at long ranges made it impossible to detect. To go along with the cloak, it had a forced plasma torpedo, which came right here out of the center of the front. In this big bay. And it would have had disruptors as secondary weapons, probably mostly for defense. In that episode, Balance of Terror, they were going for very much a submarine and destroyer theme with the Enterprise being the destroyer and this, of course, being the sub. And while this was smaller than the Enterprise, again, at 130 some odd meters, with the Enterprise at around 290 meters, it was maybe a little under half the length, but it also was wider. We can presume that the middle would have been various things and then the, the wings would house engine components and life support and then of course the rear had very large impulse drives. Now one of my big personal pet peeves are those people that insist that this did not have warp drive and I, I mention this in every video this comes up because it's just it irritates me. And I have a theory as to, you know, it's again a headcanon theory, but 
stay tuned and I'll kind of lay it on you and see what you think. But first off, just physically, it's very clear that the things on the ends of the wings are meant to be warp nacelles. They look very similar to a Constitution class, including the Bassard collectors, and even the end caps are very similar. It's warp. The only reason people hang on to this crazy notion that this was not work capable is one line that Scotty said. His exact phrase is something to the effect, I know exact, but anyway, no problem. They have they're running on simple impulse. The thing is, he's one, just talking about their power at the time, and two, he's just going on what he observes. So it's very possible they'd only used impulse to the Enterprise's knowledge. Or possibly that they could only use impulse while the cloak was up. Because the cloak took so much energy. And I could see that. And that would actually play into the um, submarine notion very well. Because old diesel electric subs from the 1940s were much slower underwater when they were running on batteries and if they wanted to use their full engine capacity they had to surface thus making themselves more vulnerable and I think they were going for the similar thing with the Romulan bird of prey here the thing is if you really are that nitpicky about things said in TOS there's a lot more problematic statements said throughout the series for example how they often call the galaxy the whole area the Federation, you know, traverses. Or in the pilot episode, how they go to the edge of the galaxy with seemingly very little trouble. You know, space stuff. And that's, that's kind of my point, too. It would be physically impossible for this not to have warp drive. Even to go from one edge of a solar system to the other, it would take months, if not years, at sub light speeds, depending on the solar system. And this is very clearly a long ways from home, as stated by the Romulan commander. I know some beta cannon says that these are dropped off by a, a support ship or, or whatever, and that's just ludicrous. We never see any evidence of that. It's just a bunch of gymnastics, just to make one little line that Scotty said, you know, fit. And the thing is, if he'd been known to be an expert on Romulan ships, maybe... This is the first time they had ever seen this design, or the Romulan cloak in the series. So, how would he know? And that, plus the visual evidence, again, I say it had a warp. And I will throw one more thing on that relates to the later Warbird, the Dideridex, in a little bit. So, if that's still not enough to convince you, I'll throw one more theory at you in a minute. But yeah, very clearly related designs. And pretty much the premier Romulan ships. We know, for example, this one was the Praetor flagship, as stated by the commander and the pride of the fleet. It seems to have a very submarine-like interior, very claustrophobic. has a, a number of crew. We don't really know how many. Probably much smaller than the Enterprises. But again, going on the submarine theme, we could assume just based on the size and everything else, maybe you have a crew of between 80 and 100, if they really packed them in. And it does have the very cool <laughs> bird of prey, war bird on the bottom. Remember when I was a kid and I first found out there was a uh, Romulan bird of prey, it blew my mind because I wasn't alive in the 60s, and so I was very much accustomed to Star Trek 2 and 3, and watching the original series as reruns that they've been playing since the 70s. And for some reason I hadn't seen the episode Balance of Terra for uh, for a long time. But they, they came out at very odd times in my uh, childhood. So it's not really surprising. As far as these models from Eagle Moss, they're both among my favorites. The Enterprise one was... Yet another one of the initial reasons I got into the Eagle Moss collection because there are very few physical models of this and I was always curious what it looked like. The uh, 
TOS one here, I knew what they look like because I had um, old, I guess it was what, AMT models of it. And then later there were the Micro Machines ones in the 90s, so I knew what it looked like. But I'm actually very happy with the Eagle Moss because they added quite a bit of extra detail. And they made a, what could have been a otherwise very bland model. Actually very attractive in my opinion. And uh, the original model, of course, for this was uh, CGI completely. And for this one, was a was a real miniature, but very basic. I mean, 1960s budget. The Enterprise model did get quite a bit of attention, but this one was made on a low budget, so it was pretty pretty simple. And they only really had the footing footage from Balance of Terror. They reused it in season two. Yes, yeah, season two. What was it? The Golden Years of the Dangerous Years. The one where they all get old. So they reused the Romulan Bird of Prey in season two, but I think it's just the same stock footage, just multiplied. But we do see several assault the Enterprise when it tries to cut through the neutral zone. Strangely, in that episode, their plasma torpedoes aren't near as dangerous. In Balance of Terror, one of them knocks the Enterprise's shielding down, and they say one more hit would knock it out. Also, one torpedo hit, we presume, knocked out an entire outpost. But in the second episode, we see these multiples hit the Enterprise and just do moderate damage. That's what I mean about kind of sticking to certain lines. The, the, the characteristics of such ships just kind of go with what the plot needs, you know? And that's okay, because it's all fiction. Speaking of, the next ship here, the Romulan D7. I bet you thought the D7 was Klingon. Well, it is. It's also Romulan. And it's a fun story that I always enjoy repeating. Now, this is, of course, a Romulan, a, a Klingon model from my like, Eagle Moss. I'm glad they didn't try to do a Romulan version for the standard Eagle Moss collection. But if they wanted to do a special, you know, uh, bonus edition or convention special where they painted this up to be Rom Romulan, you know, with the bird on the bottom and Romulan markings and maybe a few little changes just to make it look different. I think that would be really, really neat. Even though I couldn't see the difference, I would know. And they've done this before, for example, with the USS or SS Yorktown, as well as the USS Defiant. So they've reused the Constitution model mold, just changing the paint schemes to make them different Connies. So I know the main series is over. They're up to issue 180, but they can still do specials. And if they want to do a Romulan one for the D7, hey, we just don't have many Romulan ships, so please. This was in Season 3, one of, one of the episodes I really enjoy, the Enterprise Incident. And the real world reason was twofold. One, the original Romulan Bird of Prey model here was lost and or destroyed through, well, anyway, disputes and things behind the scenes. And two, they just had this new fancy Klingon model made with much higher quality, more detail. And they'd only used it once or maybe twice as a Klingon ship, so they reused it as a Romulan ship. To their credit, they did first call it a Klingon ship, and then Spock corrects them, saying that recent intel has it that Romulans are using a Klingon design. So they, they acknowledge it and, and have a couple of lines of dialogue to explain it. So, hey, for that era and time, that was pretty, pretty good of them for continuity. But yeah, they just wanted to use their new model that was better looking, and they, they had three of them. When they did TOS Remastered, they actually replaced one of the three with a Romulan Bird of Prey here. So, I like that nod. We do see a bit of the interior in that episode, but it's just your basic kind of plain interior. Funnily enough, I don't think we ever saw the interior of the Klingon version, so... In some ways, we saw more of the Romulan D7 than the Klingon. Beta Cannon has it that around 20, 
to 66 the Romulans and Klingons traded technology the Klingons got cloaking which would explain their bird of prey and the Romulans got the D7 chassis which would explain why they started to go to a larger ship and some beta canon also says this is when Romulans got warp drive which is bullshit because they had to have warp drive already otherwise they would have been a laughable power power the D7 is quite a bit larger at uh, around 220 to 230 meters the Klingons crew it with between 400 and 440 people we might assume the Romulans don't have quite as many on board but it's pretty analogous to a constitution meaning three of these would very much be just an overwhelming superiority to the uh, Enterprise and that's how it's treated in the episode as well so that that levels out it would have had disruptors, and we can assume they would have plasma torpedoes instead of Klingon photons, and a few other changes. And the big deal about the Enterprise incident, they had a new cloaking device. And what's funny is, in the episode, again, getting into dialogue and continuity, they kind of act like the balance of Terra didn't happen because they are talking about the brand new Romulan cloaking device, never seen before that the Federation needs to get their hands on. Now, of course, we can kind of retcon that to say that, well, it's just a new cloak, a, an upgraded one. And that does kind of get borne out by the on-screen evidence because whereas the first generation we saw has um, kind of a sensor ghost left over, this one seems to just make the ship literally blink out of existence like that and be completely undetectable. It also seems to be quite small, at least man portable, so maybe they made it better and more compact. And it doesn't seem to have the energy drain, so we can just assume that it was a um, more advanced cloak. But anyway, we, we see that once in Season 3. And that would be the last Romulan ship we would see until... The very end, the final episode of Season 1 of The Next Generation. We don't see a Romulan ship throughout the rest of TOS. We don't see one in the animated series. And we don't see a Romulan ship throughout the entirety of the motion pictures. And up until the neutral zone, that final episode where we get to meet the warbird here, the only time we hear about Romulan ships is in that episode, Angel 1, where they're trying to get a vaccine, and, and it said that Romulan quote unquote battle cruisers are nearby. So we can assume, with some reasonableness, reasonableness, sure, why not, that they may be using these ships still or something evolved from them. And that would make sense because this warbird here is known as a B type or type B meaning there had to have been an A type and before we move into the next generation period I'll say this we know very clearly from next generation and Deep Space Nine that the warbird here uses a forced quantum singularity basically an artificial black hole is its power source and uh, warp core Okay. So they don't use matter, antimatter. Is it possible that, going way back to the TOS Bird of Prey, that they too used a force singularity, or maybe just even batteries, and so they did not use matter, antimatter, and so the Enterprise sensors did not detect it, and that's why Scotty didn't think they had a warp drive, because they didn't use matter, antimatter. They used something else. Just a theory, and... You know, I think on top of everything else, it's just one more thing that pretty neatly fits into canon. Let me know what you think. And with that, we'll move on to the new era and the second set of ships in our video. Often just called the Romulan Warbird. The Romulan name is Dideradex. 
And again, the Federation called it a B-type. This was their preeminent frontline multi-role starship in the TNG era. And because I think it scales well with the later Valdor and Scimitar, I brought out the XL edition. I think it does the ship justice just considering its size. The only downside is this table is ever so slightly tilted forward and this stand kind of sucks so it doesn't ever want to stay on the stand here. That's I really like this XL from Eagle Moss but oh the stand they, they kind of with the small with the standard series Warbird they had an original acrylic piece like this and that too didn't like to stay on so they actually extended the top forks I don't know why when they did the XL they went back to the old style top I may have to try to mod it myself to keep it to stand on more a big problem too is just the weight and this really needed a center mount not a rear mount because so much is on the head here because this is all die cast metal Yeah, this is the first Romulan ship that we really saw in detail, both internal and external, and that we really got to know well. It was also the last ship designed by Andrew Probert, which is neat. In the original series, the Klingons were kind of the breakout villains in the movies too. But by the next generation, they were the Federation's allies, which I like. I like that they showed that side, that the Klingons could be just as great of a friend as an enemy. That meant, though, they needed a new adversary. They tried the Ferengi, and while I think the Ferengi found their position, they were not intimidating. And the reason they held off initially, bringing the Romulans in was an edict from the great bird of the galaxy himself, Gene Roddenberry, who didn't want much of the TOS era in his new Next Generation. But by the end, there was a bit of flex, and they, they brought him in. And so our introduction to the new Romulans was with this ship. Interestingly, in the beginning, they play a kind of a cat-and-mouse game in the episode, where they let the sensor echo, sensor ghost show through the cloak to see what the Federation might do. But then they, I guess, fully engage the cloak and it completely disappears from sensors, telling us, as they say in the episode, that they have definitely improved their cloaking device since last they met. The Romulans had kind of been on a bit of a, I don't know, exile or just off doing things in the Beta Quadrant to their own. They were basically being isolationists, kind of like the U.S. in the 1930s to some extent. But as Gul Dukat, although he wasn't Gul Dukat, said at the time, we're back. And they came back in a big way with this ship. It is between... 1,050 and 1,350 meters long. Again, sources disagree. That's why making these models to scale would be impossible. And of course, it's quite wide too. It's said to have up to 63 decks with a crew of roughly 1,500 and a much larger troop carrying capacity on top of that. It also has a large shuttle bay, or maybe two of them, capable of carrying long-range shuttles that are about 30 meters, or scout craft that are nearly 90 meters long, and even smaller fighters, maybe somewhat analogous to the later scorpions we see in Nemesis. It has disruptors that could be fired either as a continuous beam or pulses. 
and it continues to use plasma torpedoes, not photons. We know this from Deep Space Nine when the Romulans are stocking plasma torpedoes for these during the Dominion War. This was introduced sometime between 2360 and 2363, so right around the same time as the galaxy. It is more heavily armed than the galaxy and has a cloaking device, obviously unlike the galaxy. On the other hand, it has a slower warp. It can only safely warp at about 6 and be fully undetectable with the cloak. Beyond that, emissions start to really seep through the higher warps you get to. Cruise warp was about 7 with minimal bleed from the cloak and maximum safe warp was 9 past that as we know in the Iconian gateway episode contagion that anything past 9 risks permanent damage to the systems and we see a ship going at warp 9.6 that's pretty much just burning its warp drive out as I said earlier these use an artificial singularity, a black hole for the power source for the warp drive. Interestingly, once this source is started, it's pretty much continuous. It's kind of an analog, kind of a statement for nuclear power. It seems to be on that level in the sense that once it's going, it's going, and then you have to find some way to safely dispose or shut down the reaction. This ship is mostly a warship, but it's more of a big bulk battleship, not necessarily the fastest or most maneuverable. Its size is intimidating, but it can work it against it, meaning it's a big target. It is really analogous to the Galaxy class. On the other hand, it does have very competent science facilities, so I'm like a Klingon ship and it is mechanically very advanced and it has clean comfortable but also sterile and very militaristic interiors so unlike a Klingon ship that's very rough and ready and we can assume smells just fantastic this seems to be very antiseptic in the interior yeah, this is the, the main Romulan ship all throughout TNG. And it's also the ship seen in the early seasons of Deep Space Nine and the main Romulan ship seen during the Dominion War. Where they proved to be very capable but not perfect. And we also see these more than once in, uh, in Voyager. And they were still very much in service and mass-produced in the late 24th century but that kind of gives way to this next ship which we don't even really know the name for not officially we call it the Valdor type or often just Valdor class after the first ship scene but at least unlike the TOS ship it, it did have a name so that's something. It's also been called in Beta Canon the Mogai class. Or the Nerexa class. And it's only seen on screen in the movie Nemesis. Star Trek 10. This is a more advanced ship than the Dideridex, but also smaller. It's just over 600 meters long, although it is roughly 900 meters wide. It would seem to have a crew of also roughly 900. It has, again, disruptors, and it has one main forward plasma torpedo launcher, which can shoot out to four in one burst. It seems to also have a 
modern cloaking device improved upon from the Dideridex one can safely kind of assume that they've increased the speed limit kind of worked through some of its earlier deficiencies it is a faster more maneuverable vessel and it does have more offensive punch than the Dideridex but on the other hand it may have somewhat weaker shielding and armor and so can't stand the fight quite as long but there and again it is a smaller faster target so it shouldn't be getting hit as much it's a lot like a, the Federation ships we start to see in the 2370s and that they went to easier to produce smaller designs and these definitely seem to be quicker and faster to produce than the Dideridex here and more geared for war vis-a-vis -a, -vis a multi role we can definitely imagine that these don't have the ability to carry as many troops and maybe don't have as many science facilities research facilities they still have shuttle bay with a good number of shuttles but it's also possible they couldn't carry the large scout craft like the Dideridex could it's often said that these come in either green or brown variants in reality these were done just to delineate the two different ships for the film so people knew that two of them were there who's to say if that if there really were different colors or if it even mattered or it could have mattered we just don't know but these seem to start to really replace the Dideridex the first ones seem to come in service around 2375 2376 or and or at least in full production by 2378 and one can assume they were built again with lessons learned from the Dominion War because Romulans did suffer quite a bit during that war including losing their flagship which I believe was the Dideridex in the real world where is the warbird had been made by Andrew Probert this was made by John Eves and it's pretty much a collage of features from the original Warbird and the Klingon Bird of Prey. Obviously, most noticeably the wings, but these are fixed wings. They don't move. And it has the very head-on profile of uh, the other. I think it's really interesting, too. It has t two little baby wings underneath keeping the technically still same split hull design if only in a small way and then these are definitely considered to be warp nacelles out here on the wing tips and today this is pretty much the most modern advanced standard production Romulan Warbird we've seen because so far Picard hasn't given us a modern ship that is of course except for the good old scimitar the scimitar here which is called on screen a Warbird so it fits into the video and we end with the Riemann Warbird Scimitar. The most advanced ship of the fleet. And this model is uh, from Eagle Moss's special edition which is their large but not largest series but again <clears throat> it actually scales pretty well with both the the Derridex and the Valdor it is in universe about 
890 meters long and about 1300 meters wide but of course a lot of that are these wing structures which don't really house a whole lot <clears throat> most of it's in this central square portion body fuselage here and it's said to have a crew of roughly 1500 so again kinda like the, the Deradex and again having large troop carrying capabilities and having a large shuttle bay it can carry up to three dozen scorpion type scorpion class fighters plus other support craft like the Romulan shuttle on screen what we know about it <clears throat> it has 52 disruptors 27 plasma torpedo banks and a Thaleron weapon which is directly tied into its Thaleron cloak which is said to be a perfect cloak meaning that it's not detectable and the ship can fire weapons through the cloak it's also said to have primary and secondary shielding and all other kinds of fancy things <clears throat> and in some ways I kinda hate this ship because it does seem like you gave a 12 or 13 year old the designs and he just made the uber most overpowered ship possible the thing is in history we've had kind of cases of this for example Japan's own Yamato and Musashi battleships so in history sometimes there have been kind of those uber <clears throat> overpowered yet single eggs in one basket type ships Nemesis I think the saddest thing about that film was the bones were there for a good film it needed more character building it needed more fleshing out some more dialogue some more exposition and sometimes the direction for things like the battles was just a little too much it's a shame because it could have been a pretty decent film but it was kind of a swing and a miss that said I know all the criticisms it gets these days I enjoyed it <clears throat> when it was in the theaters and I still enjoy watching it even today so it's, if it is it's a guilty pleasure but I honestly don't think it's all that uh, all that bad who knows it just I don't know, maybe one day they'll do a director's cut and restore some of the scenes that were taken out and I don't know, it is what it is. <clears throat> but obviously in universe in the film this is the the flagship of Praetor St. John? St. John? No. <laughs> yes. But uh, the card's clone which Say what you will, I still think Tom Hardy definitely did a good job with that, portraying a Star Trek villain. And the way the whole thing came to be is quite interesting. And I was really happy when Eagle Moss finally released the ship. It took him a while to come out with. And sometimes I'm not thrilled when they do the <clears throat> special edition sizes because they just don't look right with the other ships but this one really does and actually I really wish they had done the uh, Dominion battleship in this scale because sometimes size is critical to a, sh a ship's identity if that makes any sense they don't do a small version which is good because even in this scale, these wings are paper thin nearly. And they are plastic. The body is the is the metal. But this was always just a CGI model, not a real physical miniature. 
in the back we have warp nacelles or warp modules very dominion in fact the ship has kind of dominion elements like the battle cruiser or battleship in interior it's very cathedral very large very open it is Riemann technically although obviously there's a lot of Romulan going on here too and that's really all we can say it was strictly alpha cannon primary cannon on screen and so it does seem a little weird just based on on-screen data that the Remans were able to build this totally in secret and then surprise Romulans with it and then take over because the Remans were a slave race used as shock troops during the Dominion War and we also see them used as guards and cannon fodder in Enterprise and we can assume they might have been used in the Earth Romulan War as well but the Beta Cannon and secondary sources really do flesh the ship out and give it a lot more cohesion and provenance, frankly. With the Desiradex, we already see that the Romulans were perfectly happy to do large, overpowerful ships. And then it made sense that they would go to the Valdor after the experiences in the Dominion War, even though. It's very likely these weren't in widespread use when it ended in 2375. But there would have been those in the Romulan Navy that still like the big imposing ship style. Some do like the, the big punch. And others just like the prestige that comes with building the biggest, baddest ship on the block. So, a lot of Beta Cannon has the scimitar design starting off as a Romulan project that was shelved after the Dominion War was over. Likewise, they have the Thaleron system as a Romulan project. And it's said that Thaleron is really something that can only be generated using the artificial singularities powering Romulan ships like that's one way to have Thaleron radiation which is extremely harmful to organic tissue but it acts kinda like a modern-day EMP and that while it it leaves it's kinda the opposite of an EMP I guess I should say because an EMP will destroy tech but leave humans more or less undamaged well, the Thalerons, the reverse, it leaves tech undamaged, but will destroy all organic. Meaning that, you know, they could just use it and wipe out a colony, and then take over the facilities. And originally, Romulans were not having very great luck in the Dominion War against the Jemadar, who, unlike the Federation and even Klingons, would just fight and fight and fight till there was nothing left. To that end, they started using Remans as shock troops, promising them freedom and other amenities if they would fight for them. And the Remans, having very little to lose, and also freedom as a great motivator, fought like wet cats and were very effective against the Dominion. Having a taste of freedom and getting some military and political ecumen from this during the war when it ended, they still were driving on. And the secret project that would be the Scimitar Warbird ended up being made in a secret base. Some say on Remus, others say in Romulan occupied Dominion space by those in the Romulan military that were still in favor of making these large ships. And then Thaleron was integrated as a basically biogenic weapon. Super illegal, but, well, you know. As far as the quote-unquote perfect cloak, 
Well, they used the Thaleron generator to power it, and they used studies that the Jemadar had done using their anti-proton beams to detect Romulan ships to basically engineer a better cloak and also one that they could use their shielding and uh, fire their weapons through. While this is a bit much, keep in mind Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country, has a Klingon ship over, well, just about a hundred years earlier, ninety years earlier, that has a cloak they can fire through, so if the Klingons could have done it generations earlier, it's not all that implausible that the Romulans couldn't as well. In fact, it's a little odd that no one else had come up with it in the interim. So, you know, that makes sense, and the Sailor Run weapon makes sense if you want to wipe out a colony of Jim Hadar or humans, and then take it over. And while the idea that the Remans could construct such a behemoth in secret, keep in mind the Remans were a full population, full planet, and this was just one ship. And as vast as it is, modern day warships, modern day carriers, are <laughs> not that much smaller by volume. And so it's possible that a race could have easily constructed one of these, especially if they borrowed or stole Romulan tech. And the Romulans are always known for their scientific advancements. Plus, finally, we know that uh, they had some support in the Romulan Navy, Romulan Starfleet, as it were. So with support and tech and whatnot, it is plausible that between 2375 and 2379 they were able to construct the prototype of the ship, the Scimitar, and then making it their flagship. And then once you have that, and considering that the Romulan Navy was in a weakened state post-Dominion War, it's conceivable that with their allies in the Romulan military, the Remans could have a coup d'etat and uh, and take over. Again, the ship is still pretty overpowered, but yeah, it is what it is. If you look at modern ships, again, there are some pretty... We just compare American supercarriers to those fielded by any other Navy, and they seem pretty overdone as well. As far as the design, you know, we have the two warp nacelles again a large internal volume it said that this was built using tech from the Dominion ships what the Romulans had confiscated in the real world this was designed by John Eves and he freely admitted he used inspiration from the uh, Dominion battleship the big one in the Star Trek universe, honestly, if the Dominion could build a couple of ships that size, which was a gargantuan just like this one, if they could do it, why couldn't the Romulans and or Remans? Just saying. I know it's a little flimsy as far as that, but like I said at the beginning, Beta Cannon does rationalize this ship and at least give it some plausibility. But, um, again, with Beta Cannon, even though the scimitar was destroyed, it's said that by the 25th century, these were made in limited numbers to be used as command ships and ground assault support ships and basically just uh, high ranking flagships of political officials. So it's kind of like the, the Klingon Negevar. Even size-wise, it's not that much bigger. The Negevar is uh, pretty heavily crewed and whatnot, too. So, you know, it kind of fits in. You know. And its different look would make sense if you consider the Riemann influence plus the Dominion technology. 
John Eves also said he took a little bit of inspiration from the Sona look and the Breen look, kind of that more organic style. So it is what it is. But it definitely took a beating before it went down. It, you know, it was the Enterprise E, the Sovereign class, one of the most powerful Federation ships. And it, two of these Valdor classes. And even then, really what gave it the edge and allowed it to be defeated was Picard's knowledge of himself and insight and basically the willingness to sacrifice the Enterprise to destroy the Scimitar which to be fair was on a path to Thaler running Earth which would not have been a good thing but on the other flip side of it it did lead to peace talks between the Federation and Romulans and things were really looking up in the 2380s right up until J.J. Abrams decided to destroy Romulus and Remus by blowing up a star which frankly still doesn't make sense if it was the Hobus star if it was the Romulan star that makes a heck of a lot more sense but I digress Again, I don't think these directors really understand just how big space is. It is... Anyway. Ugh. I won't get into a rant. <laughs> so yeah, I just thought I'd give the Romulans some love since I've talked about Klingons in Federation some and kind of put all of them in perspective. While the scaling is not perfect between these three, it does give you a sense. I mean big and big and then slightly smaller but still very big I mean for an Eagle Moss standard this uh, Valdor is quite large it's quite light because of how thin it is the same goes for the uh, scimitar here just because it's very thin wings but I really like both of these especially the Valdor but I was really happy to get the scimitar too because before this model came out I really didn't know what this ship looked like so if nothing else, it was uh, great to finally get a good feel on her. And of course, the, the Derridex. I knew what this looked like. I had models and ships of this, and there was uh, plenty of Micro Machines, and there was the Playmates ship in the 90s. But nevertheless, it's a neat design, and this uh, XL. Some of the XLs I'm kind of critical of. I don't think they really give more, but... The extra weight and size doing the NXL with this ship really, really helps. It's not the heaviest, but this whole thing, including the head, is metal. It's also green. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, showing the Romulans some love. I didn't do their smaller ships this time. This video is long enough, but uh, I've talked about them in the past, like the drone and the shuttle. And I might talk about them again. Just hanging out and having fun. I might even do a video on Nemesis, because that film I really... Yeah, I think it had a lot of potential. And with that, I'll let you go for this day. If you have any comments or just want to talk Romulans, feel free to post them below. And as always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time. Jalan True.